So when, when I submitted this thing, I didn't I didn't necessarily realize that it was the length of the talk was only 15 minutes. So I I put together a really nice deck of slides, assuming it was going to be like a normal you know 30, 35, 40 minute talk or whatever. And then I did see that, and I spent some time taking slides out and consolidating things and crunching and so on. And then I saw that I was the first guy out of three, so I just. And the third guy is one of my folks too. So I just, I just put all the slides back in. <laughs> so, so before I dive in, um, we we gave one of these talks at the Moot in Universal City last year, an update on where we were a yearish ago. Was anyone at that? At, at our talk, yeah. one one night. Thank you for coming. There's going to be a little bit of repeat because I I figured there wouldn't be a lot of people. So I'm going, to, I'm going to go over some of the um, the stuff that got us to where we are now, and, and I hope I'll do that relatively quickly, and then and then talk a bit more about what we've done in the past year since since we met last, and then a little bit about where we where we think we're headed. So, so the, the the thing we're we're using for our learning analytics is called the Learning Analytics Processor. It came out of a project called o OAAI. It was funded by the Gates Foundation and Carnegie and so on. Uh, and um, there's a whole bunch of information about that. And that was that was three or four years ago. Uh, and, and we've been working on it for about three years. We partnered with Marist College, who did the original research, and a company called Unicon that writes code to bring LAP to our campus. Okay. Um, if anyone's interested in the research that led to this modeling software, you can take a picture of that or find it on the uh, on the Moot website later. But that's that is the paper that led to the learning analytics processor. So the first year we did anything at all was a proof of concept. We just took a whole bunch of it's a little, let me say, a little bit of historical data. We didn't have all that much. Sent it up to the people at, at Marist College. They did some stuff uh, to show whether a prediction was, you know, worth considering. Whether we had data that was worth considering. And it turns out it, it was. It looked pretty good, um, but. Uh, there were some things we needed to do to get get there. So, so the proof of concept was done with all relational database tools, small small set of data, like I said. So the second year, we spent making it bigger, better, more awesome, more like the six million dollar man or whatever. And so we moved we moved from relational database tools to large data tools. So we had to migrate all of the infrastructure to Hadoop. Um, so that it could handle larger amounts of data, because it turns out we generate lots and lots of data. And again, we had similar similar results. And it, up to this point, we had only been working with one one model, right? So, so that that's a very quick way to get us to this year, right? So the past year, we've been working on more robustness. So uh, up until this point, we've taken data from our student information system and from Moodle, but that was it. Right, we spent a lot of time getting those things to talk to the model to get the stuff in the right format for the model. Jeff had to map things to fit into the way the model worked from Moodle. All the while, we're thinking we would like to be able to incorporate information from other tools. We have other tools on campus. We have Blackboard Collaborate. We have media sites. Students watch videos. There's a lot of blog files about you know, when they start the video, when they stop the video, did they watch the whole thing? Did they watch it at regular speed? Did they watch it at 1.5x or 2x or chipmunk through it at 3.5x or whatever? All of that stuff seems like it would be valuable for predicted, predicting student success, right? And so we'd love to be able to incorporate those into the model as well. So it turns out it's a lot easier to do that if we have a learning records warehouse. So we are in the process, this, this past year we started the process of standing up Learning Records Warehouse. The idea is, is that you funnel all of your data that you want to collect into the LRW, and then you only have like one channel that gets from the LRW to the modeler, but everything sort of coalesces in the warehouse. 
The other cool thing about the warehouse is, is that if you've got data that you think sometimes might be valuable, you can go ahead and put it in the LRW. Because one, one, one of the things we've learned from uh, statistical modeling such as this is the more old stuff you have, the better your predictive quality is, right? So the, the old stuff is used to train the model. So if I'm like, you know, um, our campus does card swipes for you to get into the gym. Is, is, is your gym activity a predictor of whether you're going to do well at the university? I don't honestly know, but if we, if we think it might be, let's go ahead and collect the data now so that in three or five years when we're, we run out of all the obvious stuff, we could say, hey, I wonder if that card swipe thing is worthwhile. And we've got some data, right? So, so, so that's like the, the, the sort of side benefit is if you've got a learning electric warehouse, you can start collecting wh whatever you have. It's a very nice, uh, very nice thing. The other, um, the other thing we've done is, is wh while we've been doing this modeling and while we've been trying to come up with these predictive numbers to see if students are at risk, we haven't really given a lot of energy towards what to do with it. Okay, so we, so we get, you know, a number for a student in a class on a given day, we have a predictive number. What do we do with that number? Um, there are other people on campus who are thinking about what to do with that number, right? There are a bunch of uh, academic advisors that all work for student affairs, and it would be great if they knew what the number was. Um, but we've also been thinking it would be nice if, we had some way to expose it at least, at least to the faculty, so a faculty member teaching a class could see, you know, which of his students are at risk. And, and let me just let me just say that a lot of the time, if a faculty member looks at their grade book, they can probably tell, right, who's at risk. The issue is is that they don't necessarily go there and look, and it's sort of an effort to think about it that way, right? Because they're, they're not necessarily. Our thought is, is if I have a thing that's sort of in their face that says, hey, faculty member, these, these are the, whatever, 15% of your students that really, really could use something extra, maybe they're forced to see that that's a thing, right? Um, and they're also considering a way to expose something to the student. Now, you don't say, you know, you have a 95% risk of failing this class to a student, right? Cause that's a wrong approach. Clearly, you need a softer touch than that. But there may be there may be ways to to engage the students. And and again, I, I mean, this is so from my personal experience when I was an undergrad, I was really good at looking at the. I mean, you can calculate the math. You have the syllabus, and you know, I did you know did this well on test one, did this well on test two, and you do the math, and it's like I, I need like 173 on the final to pass. But, but I, I think I can pull it out. I think I can pull it out because you're. you're Students are really good at deluding themselves, right, and thinking that they've got it, that they can do more than the possible. And this is this is more of a, a just a shake on the shoulder to say, get some help. And the goal is to do it early, right? So in the first uh, couple of weeks. And so I don't know if you guys heard uh, John Whitmer talk yesterday and say that they were seeing sort of the sweet spot on the predictive. Uh, quality somewhere in the two to three week range, which I, I found very enheartening because that's kind of where I'm aiming. I would like to be able to, within those first two, three, four weeks, know which small chunk of the students need somebody to tap them on the shoulder and say, you know, we have some resources. You're, you're struggling. It looks like you might be struggling in this class. We want to help you. Um, not not at midterm or whatever when it's too late or two weeks before the end of the semester when it's way, way too late. So, so anyway, to that end, we wanted to open, we, we were implementing this open dashboard. I don't know if any of you guys have seen open, open dashboard, but it, it's gone through a lot of uh, revision in the past year. Uh, while we were spending a year working on beefing up the infrastructure for big data tools, to use the, the, the learning analytics processor. There's a group in the UK, JISC, J-I-S-C, it's a group of institutions in the UK, also working with Uniton, 
to try and make Open Dashboard a nice, better thing. Uh, so, so they're working with Unicon and Marist. We're working with Unicon and Marist. It's not, we're not all working together, but because they put all this effort into Open Dash, I get to, we get to install Open Dash and a better Open Dash without having to pay for all of that work that they did. And, and they get a better learning analytics processor engine because we invested a bunch of time and effort into figuring out how to build all of those big data tools. It's, a, it's kind of a win-win. Um, so another big thing that we played with this, uh, this year was, was cohort. So originally, the first couple of years, we had a single model for the entire campus. We're a big school with 40,000 students, 11 different colleges from design to ag and life sciences to engineering to vet school and so on. Very, very different, very different classes. And we thought maybe, you know, if we split them up into smaller groups, we would have better predictive quality, right? Because if you lump them all together, stuff gets lost in the averages. So we, we did just that. We did it a bunch of different ways. We did it by um, enrollment size, small classes, medium classes, large classes. We did it by student level, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, grad, so on. And we did it by LMS usage, right? So we looked at the logs for the classes and said, you know, if, if there's no logs, they're not using the LMS. LMS. If there's a you know, small amount of logs, they're using it lightly. We use that as a proxy for, for depth of use. And we learned some stuff. One is that splitting by people didn't work out so well. So if I split by freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, let's say, there might be a course that has some sophomores and some juniors in the same course, which means that some of the students are in one model and some of the students are in a different model. And so it's better when all of the people that are in the same class are in the same model because they get compared to their peers. And, and if you split them in ways that divide them, that, that, that did not help. It did not make things better. The other, um, the, the other thing that we were we were happy about was that splitting by LMS usage showed some real, real promise. Now, I this is probably too small, but in the middle there's a graph. I, I put all the numbers because our, we, the other thing we got this year is a numbers guy. We have a quant uh, who works with us, his name's Chris, um, that's learning how to do all this stuff. It's not part of his sort of daily wish, so he's having to learn all this stuff as well, and, and, and we spent a lot of time doing it. But, but here's a couple of graphs, and the, the, the recall is the most interesting statistic in this whole thing, and, I, and, and, and I, uh, unfortunately, the order that Chris put them in is not the best order for visualizing, but the black bar is um, back in the old day when we used a single model for every course, right? So you, you, can, you can all, that's old. But then if, if, you, if you, in your mind, take that light gray bar that's on the, the right-hand side and slide it over to the left, that one's no LMS usage, then the next, the orangey red is a little bit, then the dark gray is a medium amount of LMS usage, and then the, 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 the darker red is um, heavy LMS usage. And you can see, right, it goes up like this, which, which means that if you use the LMS more, your prediction about student success is better. And I, I got I to say, we did, we did a dog and pony show for my, my vice provost, and, and for some reason, I'm not sure why, he really liked that fact. He's like, oh. It, it, it says that, you know, our LMSs have, have value. Um, when we had everybody in the single model, we were a little bit concerned because the difference between just predicting with demo data and predicting with demo data and LMS data was not very big. And that's, that's a bad thing for, from our perspective. Is that what that means is the, the stuff people do in the LMS maybe doesn't matter as much. If, if, all you, if all you need to predict student success is the demographic data, which is static, you know, you can have a guy with a, a clipboard at the door the first day say, yep, yep. Nope. Yep. You know, because it's a, a fait accompli. Thankfully, it's not the case, right? So if we segregate out the courses and use the LMS data, it turns out it does it does affect the model pretty heavily. So where are I? All right, we're about out of time. But real quick, 
Um, next year, we're going to integrate the dashboard into our Wolfware, which is our sort of portal, as Marty said yesterday. Um, we're going to start pushing data from our other tools, so uh, Media Site, Blackboard Collaborate, whatever else, into the LRW. We won't necessarily use it yet, but we'll start putting it in there so we'll have it. Maybe add some of their data and start playing with it in the predictive model. Depends on how much time we have to touch the tell. And then we want to start next year, right? We want to start running that modeler regularly. Right? So right now we do a, a you know, like hand work. If someone has to say, I'm going to run the modeler, we've got a bunch of steps. We want to have a lot of Quran where it runs day one, day three, day seven, whatever it happens to be. At the beginning of the semester and then pushes the data into the, into the dashboard or, or potentially to other people on campus that can then use it, uh, use it for good. Uh, so, 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 so with that, I'm, I'm done. Uh, this is a, a little bit of a, of a pitch. If anyone's interested in joining, right, we benefited from the work that JISC did on the Open Dash. They benefited from our work on uh, building the infrastructure. There's a lot more work, and, and, and certainly there's room for other people to get involved if they're interested in this model. Or it's open, it's free. You have to either roll your own code or work with Unicon, pay them to, to build code. But um, I think your, your dollars go a lot further this way. So I paid for some stuff, but I got a bigger set of things back, and you would do the same. So that's, that's, basically, uh, that's basically it. If anyone has uh, questions... Uh, so, so our proxy for the usage was the, the log, the amount of log files that were generated. So, given a certain class, if if we counted the number of lines of, of in the logs for a class and it was zero, that was a course with no usage. If it was within a certain range, it was low. Within another range, it was medium. Within another range, it was high. And I don't know, Jeff, pick where you draw the lines, and it was. It was relatively arbitrary looking at the spread. I mean, I think you looked at the spread and saw some natural places where there were there were gaps. Right. So, so right now we're working with the benefit of the entire semester's worth of data so we can look at all of the logs. So when we're at the beginning, there's a lot fewer logs, so it's harder to divvy them up. But it, so we're either going to just use what there is and hope for the best, right, and hope that the, the, the courses at the high end start strong and generate a lot of log files, or some way map them to previous semesters and know it's tough because, you know, people don't always teach the same course or the same section. If there were a way to, for sure, say this is the same guy teaching, teaching the same thing, and he was a pretty heavy user last time, he's probably going to be one this time. But it, that, that's a tough mapping to do. So we haven't exactly figured that out. But I, I suspect that in the second week we'll see a difference. Um, anyone else? Huh? Yeah. If there's time after, we can. Thank you, guys. <laughs>